All right, so um, the previous section of the class, we had Plato, then we had Aristotle's virtues um, compared to Jesus, Socrates. Then we had those four issues with Tippett and the um, theme there was the union of reason and faith, science and religion. And there were a lot of different points of view, um, how to raise children uh, to be humanistic or to be religious or uh, all those different varieties. So those are all things for you to think about. They focused on the personal, personal issues. Um, but the last section of, this, of the section on stress, Esther Sternberg said that since 9-11, Americans have been more stressed out because they finally realized they were more vulnerable than they thought they were. So then I read from some of my students' papers and I'll start the class asking you what you thought of those quotes that I read. But they show that there really isn't any true split between the personal, the social, and the political. So there's just an overall spirit of the time that takes over. The next section of the class is going to focus on the Aristotle's political virtues. And um, in that list of virtues that I've given you, you know, over and over again, um, the political virtue, uh, the idea was that we are social and political creatures by nature. And so we cannot be fully human, except in our, we develop our humanity in our interactions with other people. So generosity, like how can you be generous in a vacuum? So I think um, Aristotle would say there's the gap between self-regarding actions and other regarding actions or egoism and altruism is a completely false split because you can't be human, you realize your humanity in relationships. And what's good for the person, a healthy relationship is good for everybody in the relationship and an unhealthy relationship is bad for everybody in the relationship. So um, splitting off, you know, something that's good for me, but it hurts other people, no, that's a really crippled way to think. And it's incredibly popular in the US because also the US considers greed in general. Americans tend to consider greed to be a, vert, uh, a political virtue, right? If you aim to get rich, then you'll work hard, you're, you'll increase our economy, and everybody will be happy, right? It'll trickle down. That's, that's the philosophy. Aristotle would say, no, greed is the political evil. Um, why? Because um, when people only aim for money and they choose a job just for the salary, it pits people against each other. They're competitive, right? Somebody is going to win and somebody's going to lose. It's a zero sum game. But most of all, if money is what's valuable, the people who have more will figure out a way to um, have elected officials or appointed officials have policies, make laws, apply the laws in ways that promote their interests. So they will just get richer and the poor will get poorer. So that mentality is their self-regarding versus other regarding. Um, the other thing is when you're raising your children, 
um, on the spiritual humanism view and the liberal arts view, there are all sorts of senses of calling or meaning and purpose people have that are not people go into, but not for the money. And so when they come to college, students are exposed to people, professors, but also staff members, administrators, almost anybody who gets a salary at Lyon College could get paid more somewhere else, but they're in it for the mission. And so students need to find out what their talents are by taking all these courses, figuring out what they're good at and what they enjoy doing, and then get the credentials, but always exercise that authority for the well being of the people over whom they have that authority, the people who need what it is they're capable of providing. That's a society that's based on flourishing, not on greed. So it's not like you're telling your child to be lazy or else to go for money. <laughs> Americans really have a, an impoverished view of culture. Um, it's that you encourage your children to be highly motivated, but to find out what their sense of calling is and then to work and work to get good at that capacity. Um, all right, so Aristotle says greed is the political evil. Um, so here are his political virtues. Uh, let's see. Let's see, let me just find the list. Here we go. All right. So this is gonna be our chart, right? For the, for the day, for the time. Um, temperance, courage, and we've gone through a lot of those. Um, depression is, you know, failure at vitality. It's, you can't even think about finding the mean between extremes because you don't have enough vitality to think about much of anything. Um, uh, revenge, we talked about that, uh, mean in re relation to situations involving anger, it's an extreme, revenge is an extreme. Um, okay. So the political virtues, the pleasure that comes from making a profit, that's if you always want more than your share, more than you need, um, that's the vice. If you want less than you need, or if you don't demand that you get paid a decent salary for something that's honorable, that's the other extreme. So in general, teachers are, tend to be underpaid relative to their education, their expertise. And that's not bad. It just depends on how much how the degree of being underpaid, right? The reason why teachers always have to be a little bit underpaid is because nobody should go into it for the money, right? Anybody who can't get a higher salary than a teacher might be in it for the wrong reasons. So teachers are in it because they like kids, they have a sense of mission. So I don't think they mind if they get underpaid, but I think uh, you could argue in the US that they're seriously underpaid or especially in some of the states <laughs> like Arkansas. Um, anyway, so you can get underpaid or overpaid. Um, you can demand too little or too much, but, the, but mostly, it's people's attitude should be, they want the mean and they want to be middle-class and they want to raise their children middle-class because then the children will not obsess about money. Um, if children are too poor, they don't have time to think about anything 
but trying to make money and and they will get obsessed right they will think that money makes will make them happy and so they'll obsess about wanting to make money that's not because they're particularly greedy but that will be their goal and they probably won't be able to stop achieving that goal but it was because their excess poverty sort of crippled them in a good assessment about uh, what's the mean and how much happiness you can get just from money. On the other hand, if children grow up with too much, they think the world owes them that and they think they're going to be unhappy unless they have the excessively big house or the way too much stuff because they associate that with being happy and childhood and innocence and they think they can't be good parents unless they give their kids as much stuff, as high a standard of living as they had. And that's a kind of crippling also because it's wrong. It's inappropriate. Um, so Aristotle emphasizes the importance of a middle class. So I'm, I'm going to read, <laughs> read from that from that 25 page um, essay on Aristotle's ethics that I assigned quite a while ago, but I really would like you to read it. I would like you to use it, use quotes from it in your papers. So you sort of indicate to me that you have read it. Um, now he says, in all states, there are three elements. The one class is very rich, another very poor, and a third in the mean. Um, moderation and the mean are best. It's best to possess the gifts of fortune in moderation, for in that condition of life, people are most likely to follow the rational principle. But if you greatly excel in beauty, strength, birth, or wealth, you tend to misjudge, right? You tend uh, to value them too much. Um, on the other hand, someone who's very poor or very weak um, or, or too ugly, right, finds it difficult to follow reason. Um, and I, you know, like I was taught from kindergarten, you don't judge people on the basis of what they look like. So when Aristotle would say something like that, it was kind of offensive. But Perhaps, you know, people who are in that situation, they, because of the way people treat them, they could get obsessed about their looks. Um, and that makes it difficult for them to actually just exercise practical wisdom throughout their life. Um, so what does he say? The people who are too um, rich, Okay, one who is very poor, very weak, um, too deficient. Uh, some of them grow into violent and great criminals, the other into petty rascals, right? And the two sorts of offenses correspond. One, um, the middle class, okay, this is the main point. The middle class is least likely to shrink from rule from obeying the rule of law or to be overly ambitious for it for political power both of which are injuries to the state those who have too much of the goods of fortune strength wealth friends are not willing or not able to submit to authority right those are rich people that will not abide by the laws and if they get caught, they just hire a rich lawyer to defend them in court, which is what happened in Athens. And I think it's happening in the US. The evil begins at home for when their children, by reason of the luxury in which they're brought up, they never learn even at school, the habit of obedience. On the other hand, the very poor are, who are the opposite extreme are too greedy degraded. So the one class cannot obey and can only rule despotically. They know not how to, how to um, 
command. Okay, and the other class know not how to command and must be ruled like slaves. Thus arises a city not of free people, but of masters and slaves, the one despising the other envying. And nothing can be more fatal to this friendship and good fellowship in states than this. For good fellowship, remember, goodwill. I said you have to have trust and goodwill between people. And what this says um, is that you need to have people approximately middle class, and then they do tend to trust each other and have goodwill toward each other. Um, they don't envy each other and they don't um, degrade each other, right? A city ought to be composed as far as possible of equals and similars, and these are generally the middle class. Um, the city which is composed of middle-class citizens is necessarily best constituted in respect of the elements in which we say is the fabric of the state naturally consists. This is the class of citizens which is most secure, for they do not, like the poor, covet their neighbor's goods, nor do others covet theirs, as the poor covet the goods of the rich, and as they neither plot against others nor are themselves plotted against. They pass through life safely. So that's that's what I think, right? I think a middle class is really important. And I worry a lot about the shrinking class in the middle class in the US. And it's creating a lot of instability and a lot of resentment also. Um, and then um, the other thing, Aristotle says is that he doesn't think democracy is the best form of government. Well, what does that mean? All right, so there's six uh, forms of government, actually seven, and he defines governments by who rules. So when there's one family that rules, um, if the family rules for the benefit of the ruled, if they're just they rule for the benefit of the ruled. That's called a monarchy. If they just rule for their own power and they use the whole city for power and money and they don't care about anybody, that's a tyranny or um, dictatorship, right? If now other countries, there's an aristocracy a small group of people, families pass down um, the political leadership. If they rule for the sake of the ruled, it's an aristocracy. If they use their position just to get rich or powerful, it's an oligarchy, the rule of the rich. A democracy is a constitutional government where people are ruled by the laws and then they elect leaders who make laws and make the laws, right? So, and they take turns ruling and being ruled. They take turns engaging in the legal making of laws. Then in the enforcement of the laws is the judges, judiciary, and no, the application of the laws is the judiciary, and the enforcement is the police or the, um, so, so there's two kinds of democracy. When the, the, the majority of people who elect their politicians, when they are self-controlled and generous, okay? When they like living moderately, they like a middle class, they're generous with their money, actually, Aristotle. If they have extra money, they give it away in ways that are enlightened for the benefit of the, their fellow citizens. Um, that's, that's a healthy democracy right? If the people in a democracy, like happened in Athens when it got corrupt, they just use 
the system to get as rich as possible or as power as po powerful as possible or just self-indulgence. They don't really have to do anything. If they don't engage in practical wisdom, if they don't stay informed and they don't know how they don't, they disengage from political life and then they use the system for their own purposes. That's a corrupt democracy. And that will, all of the corrupt forms lead to instability because the people who are being oppressed will resent it, okay? In a democracy, if everybody is using the system, eventually there will be group, a group that gets richer and the, the group that doesn't can get into debt because they to live freely will end up costing you money. And if you don't work, you're gonna get into debt. So that destabilizes a society also. So the, so the best society for Aristotle is a combination where some positions in the government are elected and some are appointed. That's called a polity. And that's the United States has that. Um, that's why I was talking about the cabinet. The cabinet is appointees. And so when I decide who to vote for president, I, I pick it on the basis of who, who he's going or he or she is going to appoint to positions on his or her cabinet. Uh, because that's where, to me, that's where the president's power exists is in the cabinet. Um, plus, obviously they can declare war or not, but whether they declare war, how they conduct the war has a lot to do with who they appoint to be the head of the Department of Defense. That's their advisor um, or in the Department of State. Those people are engaged with them in conversations about uh, whether to declare war, whether to pull out, blah, blah, you know, all the particular decisions. So that's why I think that the people that a presidential candidate is likely to put on their cabinet to become their advisor, the people they talk to when they're making whatever decisions they make, which that's what you usually hear in the news is the decisions you don't, you have to realize these didn't come out of a vacuum. Who is advising them? Who are they choosing to inform them and um, help them make the best decision? Are they listening to these people? That's another issue. Anyway, the best society is one where there's a combination of elected officials and appointed officials. And the founding fathers of the US knew Aristotle's uh, politics pretty well. <laughs> and um, yeah, they, a lot of what's in our system is also in Aristotle. Um, okay, the art of legislation, always the goal is to maximize flourishing. Okay, making laws, distributing wealth. Right? There's certain kinds of, well, most wealth is socially generated. So how to allocate resources that will cultivate capabilities. So one resource is education, um, healthcare. Um, it isn't just, you know, houses and stuff like that. It's mostly these social goods. Um, the, the economic system is a system where you buy your goods to meet your material needs, but the distribution of social goods has to do with those things that aren't material, but you definitely need them. <laughs> Transportation, um, education, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, right? Everybody needs a house, they need food, but they also need... <laughs> all these other social and political goods. Uh, the rectification of wrongs, this is a criminal justice system. Um, 
how you punish people who violate the laws. And that's where Athens had a decent system, right? The institutions weren't bad. It was the corruption of the people that destroyed the city. Equity, knowing how to apply the laws, that's the jury and the judges. Um, okay, so this is the section that we're gonna start talking about today. Focus on that. Um, and we had this article, the first article I wanted you to read was um, the virtue of an educated citizen. So Mr. Taylor is an American historian and after our founders created this constitutional government, they were really worried about the education of the citizens because they knew education is really important it's not an individual achievement. It's a collective social benefit. The public has to be educated or they will be, get manipulated by monarchs and aristocrats, right? Um, so they knew in Europe that the monarch family, the aristocratic family, they had way more education than most people and they use their education to learn rhetoric and to manipulate the public. Well, that's exactly what happened in Athens, right? The sophists taught rhetoric and the, the privileged class paid them to teach them rhetoric so that they could manipulate the public into voting for whatever they wanted, either in the assembly or in the courts. Um, so this is a story about the US and the US was internally divided. It needed a strong uh, national identity. They were worried about that people would elect demagogues who would appeal to class resentments and promote the violent redistribution of wealth. Um, violence instead of right some sort of distribution of social goods that would promote the middle class. Um, okay. The, okay, so number one is the importance of education. They understand, stood that. And Mr. Taylor says that, that what was a key was that the American citizens develop this certain kind of virtue the capacity to transcend their diverse self-interest by favoring the common good of the political community, okay? Because that's exactly Aristotle's view of practical wisdom, right? What I just said, they know that. They know Aristotle's distinctions. They know Aristotle has said we are social and political by nature. All right. They know that if everyone just pursued their private interest, a republic would succumb, just like Athens did. They knew the story of Athens. Um, they needed an education to be able to distinguish which candidates for office are worthy, really want that goal, and which ones are just manipulating them for their own uh, treacherous reasons, right? Um, okay. So, and then he gives details, right? Benjamin Rush, uh, he gives specific names of people and they, uh, I mean, I think it's extremely relevant, right? I think it's amazing how the way this article's written um, it really relates to all the themes we talk about. But um, the thing that amazes me is toward the end, all right? You can just read through this, Thomas Jefferson. Um, his goal is, the problem is taxing people. You have to, you have to pay for education. And who's going to pay? You know, you have to tax people. 
So the average Joe didn't want to pay taxes for education. Um, he would, it says he would rather buy his wife a new bonnet. <laughs> and, and they're despairing. They say these Americans, all they care about is money and, and unnecessary material goods, right? They don't care about quality of life. They don't care about education. Freedom just means the freedom to make as much money as I want and buy as, all the, as much stuff as I want. So that's always been a problem. Um, and Thomas Jefferson was trying to develop a meritocracy, right? He knew that some of the immigrants who were from the aristocratic class, some of them were going to be corrupt and they were going to try to use the system, but he wanted to educate the people from the lower class, he wanted them to have opportunities to get into the governing class. He wanted upward mobility, not just economic, but in terms of exercising power. Um, leadership, it doesn't have to be political leadership, but that should be part of it. Um, this would be a new, um, the, the old artificial aristocracy is inherited privilege. The new one, is a natural aristocracy. So again, that's straight out of Aristotle also. You can just uh, believe me on that. Um, okay, yeah, <laughs> here's the quote. There seems to be but one object. All anybody cares about is getting rich. Hey, wait, that wasn't the original idea, guys. The original idea was cultivating practical wisdom, cultivating natural capacities. Um, all right. And it is interesting that even in the frontier, even when the standard of living was, was low, they would start these liberal arts schools where they actually taught Greek and Latin, you know, completely impractical. But why do they teach it? for exactly the reasons that I'm teaching it right now. It's just that somehow they thought you had to read it in Greek. And I guess I don't think you have to. Um, they wanted to promote social mobility. So New York State and in general in the North, they looked at education as a great way to um, flourish for the society to move ahead. And in the South, they did not, right? So the North got ahead, about 50 years ahead of the South, because um, Thomas Jefferson got a windfall from the 1812 war, and he had to choose between sending it out more locally and allowing local school boards to distribute and improve education, or setting up this flagship university and having those graduates go out into the frontier and educate the public. Well, he chose the flagship, which is in Charlottesville, Virginia, which is where the big riot was, the white supremacist riot, um, which is very ironic, of course, because this is Thomas Jefferson's flagship school. But the people who got educated there, not enough of them went out to the frontier. They just used their privilege to gain more privilege. And so that's why it didn't work. Um, the North decided that they were going to invest in education. Um, and so they got ahead. Now, in, but it, you know, the story continues um, for a long time until, I don't know, 50 years ago, education, broad-based public education was considered a social and political good. And then it gradually started being considered like an individual achievement. So, if, so it was another consumer product that you would buy for your kid, right? So some people buy their kids cars, some people buy them college education, but it's just a consumer product. It's your choice. It's your free choice. 
and so you minimize taxes, right? And you just tell people, go get a better job. Just save your money for college. It's individual. And that's just fatal to a democracy because what it will mean is that people with money, their children will get the education to get the jobs that pay money. And the people without money aren't going to be able to pay for the best education. So their children aren't going to be qualified for the, for the better paying jobs. So the rich will get richer, the poor will get poorer. Um, student debt has increased. People are not motivated to pay taxes. There's no knowledge for its own sake, which statistically people who are more educated are healthier. They use our healthcare system less. There's less crime. I mean, it saves money in the end. Uh, appreciation of art, it just creates a whole another network. That's why I was talking about the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities. You just get citizens engaged with the arts. Uh, grade school children who are under-resourced, right, get a chance to go to the symphony or a chance to go to the theater. And it solves two, there's two issues. First of all, they get a sense that the society cares about them. And they also get exposure to the arts and they understand, gee, this is fun or it's educational or it's something I want to be part of my life. So uh, small liberal arts colleges do that, but I do think it has to, you know, K through 12 is also really important. Uh, so, we ignore the social benefits of higher levels of education. We need them. Um, but what's happened recently, ever since 1980, is that um, the government, government, any kind of government is considered um, fascist dictatorship, right? Anti-democratic, taking away my freedom. Um, there's huge debates going on about what public education, and I do want the students to talk about that in class. What do they know about what's going on in terms of uh, what should be taught in the public schools? Arkansas has passed, gone through committee anyway, some legislation that you really need to know about. <laughs> um, also, you need to know about what are students learning who are homeschooled, for example? Have you heard of the Becca curriculum, which is big? Um, all right. So, okay. All right. Is public education anti-democratic? What do you think, right? So I'm asking you these questions. There's lots of stuff for you to come prepared to talk about. Um, since 2007, there's been huge cut, cutting of funding for schools. There's more Medicare, there's more jails and prisons, right? And so if you don't have educated people, you have more crime. If you have more crime, you have to pay for prisons. If you pay for prisons, you can't pay for education. So it's a downward spiral, right? Uh, students have to pay and therefore it becomes more and more of just an individual achievement and the aim of it tends to be more and more money. Um, okay. The politicians claim to honor the founders and then they push for the privatization of education. That is not true. That's not what the founders thought. The founders really in, emphasized public education. Um, then the thing that I find really interesting is his conclusion. Um, he says, well, we don't have any common set of beliefs. He said, well, it used to be Protestant Christianity. He said, no one creed seems capable of encompassing the diverse backgrounds and values of American st students. Um, we balk at empowering any public institution to teach a particular political orthodoxy. 
um, always celebrate as the marketplace of ideas. Well, you know, it's crazy. Like Aristotle's virtues are perfectly fine. <laughs> they do encompass these diverse backgrounds. And a historian should know that. But what's interesting about the disciplines, history, you know, Mr. Taylor does write about what some of these historical figures were thinking. But, you know, he doesn't take it all the way back to philosophy. Is what were they all thinking, right? How were they educated? And then he would understand that. So they don't always know a lot about the intellectual history. So we have this problem with specialization, which is, you know, worrisome because this should fit together. Mr. Taylor shouldn't say this. It's not appropriate. Um, we need to revive the founder's definition of education as a public good, which again is a big Greek thing. Um, the concept of virtue classically defined as a core public virtue with, worth teaching, okay? So, so they're classical. Well, that's the classics. Um, so then I ask you a number of questions about this, connecting it back to Aristotle and to Aristotle's virtues. So, um, yeah, and then the Southern states have always had a minimal government philosophy. Um, and that's important to think about this. The difference between the North's view of taxing and spending and the public good and it, the, in general, the Southern, Southerners view, especially since the Civil War, states' rights, right? They don't, and then among the states, they minimize government. Uh, I in Minnesota, I grew up where government is good, right? I would rather pay taxes than to buy a bigger house, a bigger house, a bigger whatever car, because it's in my interest. And I care about that everybody has a safe neighborhood, that everybody has decent housing, that everybody has a decent education because I like going outside and I like looking at my fellow citizens and I like knowing they're not desperate. And I just like middle-class life. I think it makes people a lot more rational um, when they're not thinking about whether they have way less or way more than your average Joe in the grocery store, right? Or your average Joe on the street. I just, I just think, being self-conscious about different differences in income is really unhealthy because you're not virtuous or vicious because of your standard of living. Um, okay. And more and more, it's the case that people are not poor because they're lazy. They, some people are, but my gosh, not most. Um, all right, so that's the one article. The other article was um, Aristotle and management, okay? And so the idea here, again, same old, um, same old basic structure. It's just how would you uh, apply that to being like a business owner or a coach or um, a teacher, but in particular, uh, a business owner or a political leader. So management, right? Um, and then I just speculate or I apply Aristotle's virtues. So that's the second article. And I will say that I, um, I would be a terrible manager because you have to keep your mind on a lot of details that I can't keep my mind on. But also, you have to have the courage to make a decision, right? Knowing that you don't know. And you can't keep second guessing yourself. And you can't keep trying to know more than you could know at that time. And the decision has to be made. So there's all sorts of managers that have to make decisions right now based on 
uh, not enough knowledge. They might be aware of that. And also every decision they make is in a context and the context changes and they have to make a different decision. I would be a terrible manager because I was keep trying, I would try to think too much. I would overthink, I would underreact. And then I would second guess, right? Um, there just takes a person, certain personality to be able to do it and to do it well and to self-correct, right? Somebody who can act knowing they don't know, but then continues to learn rather than defend what they did. Um, so that's, we can go through this. It's a long list. Um, and I would like you to read the paper, look at the list and come with some comments. And then we will talk together about all this stuff. I think what I want you to do is get this pattern in your head of your thinking of any issue and you can sort of go through that list and you can understand that, well, yeah, you know, these are all patterns, they're all there. You just uh, didn't notice it. You weren't able to separate them out and then see how they all fit together at the same time. So you're both analyzing them, separating them, and also synthesizing them, putting them back together. Okay, so I think that's enough for the video. And I look forward to talking to you about political things. I must say, I am pretty surprised. It's perhaps true that Lyon students, um, when I ask them about political things, they tend to say, well, I, I don't get involved. Now it's possible that they actually do think a lot about it, but they don't wanna say anything because the country is polarized and it's toxic and they don't really wanna to touch those buttons. Um, but it's possible they really don't know anything. <laughs> and I, it's hard for me to believe, I guess, because I was raised where that there was no such thing as not talking about, thinking about, reading about, being informed about political issues. I mean, when your dad marches in Selma, Alabama when you're in fifth grade, and <laughs> you, you kind of know stuff, you know? And uh, we used to have people in our house. I mean, we had some fugitive from Africa at one point. <laughs> he was running from some corrupt government and uh, we were sort of giving him what, what do they call it? Shelter. Um, it wasn't, it was, it didn't last very long. He, I think he was just there one night. I was just kind of like, okay, Martha, don't tell anybody that we have company or something like that. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I hope that you decide you do want to start thinking about political things and you want to self-correct because it's hard to get good information. Um, but I think I might, and we might spend an extra day that I haven't done before working on this, the issue of the cabinet, right? And I would like to find data on who Reagan appointed and what they did, and then Clinton, and then Bush, and then Obama, and Trump, and Biden because then you can see the trends. And I, I also vote based on overall what a political party, I mean, there's, it's obvious there's patterns. The political parties have come at politics from a different point of view. They have different philosophy and they appoint based on those differences. And if you could just know that, and they pretty much stick within a range, right? So I would, I, you know, I hope you decide that you want to understand some of those basics and then decide, well, which one right now thinks, do you think is the best? So I personally think this problem of shrinking middle class is the number, is a huge problem. So whichever party can convince me that they have the policies and the people who are going to be able to 
to work on it more, right? I also think climate change is huge <laughs> because I've followed it for 50 years. And, I, and that's not a matter of opinion, that's a matter of science because nature works in a way that's pretty consistent. Like human beings can change their minds a lot. So it's a, it's a lot harder to figure out how to make a middle class because people, you can put in incentives and you can do things where if you want to improve your standard of living, we're gonna put in these incentives where you, you would do X and people still do the opposite of X because they vote on the basis of something other than wanting uh, a more stable economic situation. But when it comes to climate change, like <laughs> nature won't change for us just because we don't feel like paying attention. You know, nature is going to do what nature's doing, and we can figure out what that is, and we can figure out the impact. And that is really, really serious. So, of course, I prefer politicians that acknowledge that and that really want to use the political structure not to take over the economy, but to incentivize, right? Uh, give tax breaks, incentives for businesses to go green, and also um, to uh, give disincentives to companies that um, burn fossil fuels and have huge carbon footprints, right? Like having a carbon tax. So those are my priorities uh, among them. And which party, you know, is uh, has a history of going more in that direction. But you you need maybe first of all to find out what the parties have done, what the cabinets, cabinet appointments, things like that. Then decide well which things matter to me and why. And especially right now, and especially in terms of my life, which would be 50 years from now and stuff like that. Um, but, and I, and you have to admit at certain times you'll be wrong. And, you know, I've, I have a long history of this. So I've self-corrected, I've observed. Um, and so I hope, I hope you do that, realize that's what democracy is about, that it's really a privilege to do that. But it's really difficult. Remember, practical wisdom involves all these virtues, political, well, personal virtues, social, political, uh, intellectual, relationship-oriented. I mean, it's huge. So of course, you're going to falter and, and not get it right. But it's just a constant dialogue. And if you get friends who also have that desire and also get better at it, right? They, they get wiser, <laughs> uh, practically wiser about political things. So I hope, I hope you decide to do that, but I can't, can never make anybody do anything, I don't think. So I don't, I don't push it. I just try to argue like Socrates really. You should pay attention to this. In the Apology, he said, my fellow Athenians, you come from this wonderful democracy, and yet all you do is join clubs and worry about money. You should worry about virtue and justice. So like I'm with Socrates. I really liked Socrates when I read it as a college student. Um, so, you know, I hope you'll at least consider that. All right. <laughs>